This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. This Week in Virology, episode number 139, recorded on June 24th, 2011. Hey everybody, I'm Vincent Racaniello, and this is TWIV, the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today, right here in my office, can you guess? <laughs> it's Dixon de Pommier. Hello, Vince. How are you, Dixon? I'm very well, thank you. Dixon is um, not in Fort Lee today. No. Good to see you. Always good to have you on the show. Thank you. In fact, when I'm looking out of your window towards Fort Lee, I can't see it. No, it's foggy today. Today we have a, a letter from a listener who tells us how to convert Fahrenheit to Celsius. Ah, this is good. <laughs> so we can do that. Also, also joining us today uh, from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here. How are you, Alan? I'm doing okay. I haven't heard you in a few weeks. Yeah, yeah. It's been, it was kind of strange last Friday. I, uh, I <laughs> around two o'clock in the afternoon, I, I just sort of felt like I was at loose ends. Yeah, I didn't yeah. know two, what to do. Two Dear. p.m. Fridays, Eastern Daylight Time. Have you suffered any deluges up there recently? Constantly. Yes. Yeah. Same here. Deluges yeah, so. in, the, in the sense of rain. Dixon. I have a friend who's out there yes. building an ark as we speak. Are you cloudy right now, uh, Alan? Up there. Uh, I'm not, but the weather sure is. <laughs> good, good to hear it. Yeah. All right. Well, that's our crew for today. Rich is still in Texas uh, enjoying his new grandson. I believe he'll be back next week, although he told me he's 50-50 for next week. Ah. Because uh, it depends whether they leave Texas or well, not. Well, I'll sure be here. You will? Good. You betcha. All right. Today we have two cool papers. All right. And the first one has to do with... Maybe one of our favorite viruses, Mimi virus. Mimi, yes. Remember Mimi Dixon? I do. It's gigantic. <laughs> <laughs> Mimi stands for what, Dixon? Oh, don't do this to me, please. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm just um, testing. Mega it. informational, <laughs> monstrous. Um... That's a good try. <laughs> That's very good. Well, no, they named it Mimi because when the fat virus sings, it goes, Mimi, Mimi, Mimi. I thought they named it after Eisenhower's wife, but that's another era. I guess no, not too many people would get that one. Yeah, Mimi Eisenhower. That's right. Did you know Eisenhower was the president of Columbia University? I knew that. Before he assumed the U.S. presidency? I did know that. Okay, Mimi stands for microbe mimic ah. because it was big when they first they could see it, uh, and they thought it was a bacterium. Got it. And then it wasn't, so they called it a mimic. God. It is, I think, the biggest known virus that we have so far. Uh, the, the particles are huge, and the genome is 1.2 million base pairs. And what does it infect again, just to remind me of the fact that it's an intracellular parasite? Amoeba. Ah, oh, right. Which I believe are protists, this right? This is chaos, Dixon? chaos. Yes, of course they are. They're eukaryotic protists. Is this a chaos, chaos that they're infecting? No, acanthamoeba polyphaga. Acanthamoeba. Well, at least that's what they le that's what they use in the lab. Well, yeah, but that's the one that can really cause problems if it gets through your cribriform plate because it causes primary mening meningoencephalitis. Mm -hmm. Is it the same species? Yeah, that they're using here. Yeah. Okay. It's easily isolated from the environment. All you have to do is take water and superheat it. Don't boil it, but bring it up to a high temperature. It kills off everything else, and this thing survives. And this is in the Schmutzdecke, right, Dixon? It's in the Schmutzdecke. Okay. That's in the ooze at the bottom of ponds mostly. So they use acanthamoeba to grow this in the lab. Got it. It probably, in nature, the virus grows in other amoeba, I would guess. Right. So the, the free-living one that I'm most familiar with and everybody else from their high school biology classes would be called chaos, chaos. And the reason why they named it that is because it seems to be moving in all directions at once. Chaos, chaos? Yeah. That's really a name of an amoeba? I'm not joking. Vince, I don't joke on this show. That's not uh, true. Much. <laughs> much. Much. I... I, I Modified that much. And in this case, I'm not joking. The amoeba's name is really Chaos Chaos. Okay. Yeah, yeah it, it looks that way. <laughs> Did well, you uh, punch that up on your video? Yes, or, I've, I've brought that up now. I, I am looking at Chaos Chaos. Thank you. Uh, yeah. There's also Chaos Car Carolinensis and Car Chaos Illinoisensi. Indeed. It's too bad the host here is not Chaos Chaos. That would be a great title. That's right. For the episode. Well, why don't we? Because we've already chosen a title. Yeah, well, because the, the host isn't Chaos Chaos. No, it isn't. Anyway, this paper, the title is, 
Mimi virus shows dramatic genome reduction after intra amoebal culture. Wow. I don't know why they call it intra amoebal. Exactly. It has to replicate inside the amoeba. It's an interesting. Yeah. Come yeah on. I, I would have given it another. But the, the cool thing is, they, they grew it in an amoeba in the laboratory and it lost a good part of its genome. That's remarkable. All right. Right. So, so I guess the key thing here is that they grew it apart from any of the rest of the ecosystem that it would be in. So this was a pure culture here, here. of yes. the amoeba so the question and, and no, no Sputnik virus. Yeah. <laughs> no. So a big question might arise here just by hearing that for the first time is, is it a repetitive genome or are these all unique genes? Well, these that these are genes. We're going to go into that. Okay. So these are not just junk repetitive sequences. These are actually genes No, but I mean duplicates. Uh, if, if you look at Chaos Chaos's genome, for instance, it's it's polychromatic basically it has lots of repeated uh, yeah. chromosomes now what this what this loses is actually it, it loses information it, it doesn't um have extra copies of these as far got as it can. okay so it's not polyploid yeah. in yeah. that sense and it's right. the virus that's losing the information no no i got, it. Got, I got it. it okay i just want to make sure you're on the right page i'm on the right page <laughs> <laughs> good to have you back dixon thanks vince it's we, good need, to we need here. a fall guy you <laughs> I'm and just you, kidding. I'm sorry. See how easy it is for me to fall into that. No, let's not do that. Uh, go ahead. Did we lose Alan? No, just no I'm here. <laughs> Chris Condian just sent me a message uh, ah, good. on Skype. He's missing us. Um, so they. So the point that Alan just made, I want to focus on. So in, in nature, these viruses are growing in probably a variety of amoeba. Right. And there are other organisms around, bacteria, sure. viruses, virophages. Yeah. And they believe that the reason why the genome of these viruses is so big is that they acquire genes from other organisms. Really? They call this a sympatric lifestyle. Have you heard of that before? I have, as what? opposed to? An allopatric. allopatric. Thank you. I had to. I actually had to Google these, and I, I, I thought, wait, I know these terms. Those I are ecological terms. terms for an That's exam right. once, way, way back. <laughs> That's right. That's right. And I, I looked them up and said, oh, right. <laughs> ah, so you know these, Dixon. I do. Tell course. us. You're the ecologist. Well, I mean, sympatric means it's living with a variety of life forms, and allopatric means it's living specifically oh. with a given life form. I knew you had to be on today's show. <laughs> <laughs> it just flows off your tongue like... Yeah, but I used to use those terms all the time <laughs> in the courses that I taught. That's and in, in evolutionary terms, yes. you can have sympatric speciation, where two here, species here. diverge, even though they're living in the same place. Right. They diverge for... For other reasons, and you can have allopatric speciation where they diverge because they're geographically separated. So Look it's like a, a sterile culture of a group got split off. From here, the here, group. here, like geographic isolation. Et right, like geographic isolation. So they're growing this virus in culture with just amoeba. So it's, it's allo- monospecific culture. Yeah, it's allopatric. Right? Allopatric, indeed. And their conclusion is. The virus transition from a sympatric to an allopatric lifestyle was associated with genome reduction and a production of a bald virophage yeah. resistant strain. Which There's another going. term for this culture system also. It's notobiotic. Well, because the virus it's got is, known uh, life. It's got known life in it. Oh, notobiotic? I thought it was sterile. No, no, no. Known, notobiotic means known life. Okay. And so if there's zero life, it's also it's, notobiotic. It's that would be abiotic. Abiotic. Well, in a mouse's intestine, a notobiotic mouse, there are no bacteria, right? Well, no, but there might be viruses, you see. So they include the possibility of that by saying okay. known life. So when you did those experiments at Notre Dame, yes. those mice didn't have bacteria, but no. they could have had viruses. That's correct. Okay, good. Yep. All right, so what they did here was to grow. They passaged the Mimi virus 150 time, <laughs> times in amoeba. Wow. And then after 100 passes and 150 passes, they looked at what was there. Cool. So, so the original virus is called M1. The 100th pass is M2, and the 150 is M3. That's a lot of days. I'll say. I don't know yeah. how long each cycle is, but that takes a while. Even if it's a day, it's still a lot of It's sure. half a year, right? Yep, it's a lot yeah. of work. So they got M1 is wild type with a capsid with fibers sticking out of it. M2, the fibers are shorter. and M3, there are no fibers at all, and they're called bald viruses. So huh. Mimi is a very characteristic structure where there's an icosahedral particle and these fibers sticking out that are quite long and the m4 virus m3 virus doesn't have them it's an m4 sorry so if you m4. do that with adenoviruses that have little things sticking out so i screwed up all the nomenclature m2 is a hundredth <laughs> passage right m3 is 150 and then they cloned from m3 and they get m4 
which they right. characterize in this paper. <clears throat> Sorry, Dixon, you were going to say? No, the other viruses have spikes also, correct? Adenoviruses? Yeah, I just mentioned one of them. And uh, do they lose those spikes after serial transfer? I don't know of any reports of that. There are other viruses that certainly lose sequences with transfer, but Interesting. I don't know that adenovirus does. Right, okay. they mentioned pox viruses in the paper, and there's yeah. actually another ah, okay. interesting parallel with that, too. Wow. All right, so what genes are lost? Exactly. There are genes at both ends of the genome. Interesting. Okay, and there are also some deletions throughout the genome, but the main deletions are at the end. It goes from 1.2 million base pairs to 993,000 base pairs. This is a big loss. Yeah. What, these per have, what percent these is that? Well, proportionally, that's, what, 10% or something? Yeah, but these could have been genes that they picked up from other organisms that they have no use for, but they just carried them along anyway. Bingo. Yeah. There's, yeah. That's probably it. They don't need them anymore in this uh, allopatric culture, right? Right. Yeah, and in fact, um, I think they commented the discussion that the, the core, the middle portion of the Mimivirus genome is where you see the, um, the genes that are most Conserved. similar to other related viruses got it. and the ends are where you see the greatest diversity i think i got that right mm -hmm. and those those highly diverse huh. ends is where you lose the bits so the model is um that what you're getting is the the things that were most recently acquired were things that were specifically for this um normal sympatric mm -hmm. environment in the mm -hmm. schmutzdecke or wherever <laughs> um and those are, not lose. those are not necessary when you don't have all that uh, all that other stuff coming in so the genes, 155 coding sequences were lost, and these are genes, proteins involved in carbohydrate metabolism, DNA recombination, a tRNA synthetase, other proteins involved in translation, proteins with anchorin repeats, which we'll go into in a minute, protein kinases. <laughs> By the way, Dixon, do you know what an ORF that has no known function is called? An open reading frame. That has no, no known function. Yeah, the protein doesn't have any known function. Do you, uh, you know what that's called? No, but I'm no, I know you're going to tell me. Or, an orphan. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's true, O-R-F-A-N. Interesting. Uh, let's see, what else? Okay, so then some of these genes were composing the, the fibers that stick out from the particles. Right. Are those the anchorin? Uh, no, that's sequences? not anchorin. Oh, too bad. So they actually did a lot of study. They did some proteomics to show that the loss of the fibers is associated with the loss of specific genes hmm. that we don't need to go into. Hmm. Uh, and these are also um, glycosylated, and presumably some of the, did I say there were some carbohydrate metabolism genes? Maybe they were involved in that. They're so events. involved in antigenicity of the particles. So when you take away these fibers, they don't react with antibodies anymore. Right. So this raises an interesting question because its host cell is rather unique. What's that, the amoeba? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, does this virus actually need to go outside the amoeba to get to the next virus, to, to get to the next cell, rather? Because the amoeba is going to divide by binary fission. It would sort of transfer some virus into the next cell by just the fact that it divides. Yeah, these are lytic. They kill the amoeba. They do kill the amoeba. Yeah. Okay, there's no latent phase. In fact, phase. that's what the viral phage does. It spares the killing to a certain degree. Right, right. It slows okay. it down. So it must go outside to get back in. Yeah, you can make virus preps, which are cell-free. Okay. Yeah. okay, just curious. I believe that's the case, but I could be wrong. All right, and there's no integration of this genome into the... Um, the Not known to be, no. Okay. And it replicates in the cytoplasm rather than yeah. the nucleus? Okay. It makes its own virus factory. It. And that's another thing okay. here. The factories are slightly different ah. in cells infected with these bald viruses compared to uh -huh. the uh, parental virus. Uh -huh. They downsized. <laughs> they downsized their factories, <laughs> right, yeah. Right, right, right. The unions came in and uh, no, no, we didn't go into that. No. What else? There's one other thing. Ah, these... these these uh, virus-infected cells, the M4 virus-infected cells, cannot be infected with the Sputnik virophage. Hmm. You remember that, Dixon? I do. Yeah. It's a little virophage that will infect yep. Mimi virus-infected cells. It goes into the virus factories and takes yes. what genes yes. it needs yes. to replicate. Yes. Yes. It makes little viruses, and it inhibits the replication of the Mimi. But yes. these Sputniks cannot <laughs> infect cells, Mimi, infected with the M4 variant. Very interesting. And they say that this could be because the Mimi virus needs these 
fibers produced by the uh, uh-huh. wild type virus to get into cells. Oh. Now, it, which is interesting because um, you would think something that uh, makes it insusceptible to Sputnik would be positively selected, but presumably there's something else, there's some compensating advantage of whatever yeah. these fibers are doing for the virus that, uh, that causes it to have that out in the wild. Um, exactly. So it probably allows yeah. it to compete better with something else, and the downside is that it allows right. it to get infected with Sputnik. Yeah. I, th- I had the same thought. There must be a balance, yeah. E- evolution is full of trade-offs. It is. Here, here. So it raises huge questions with regards to the origins of the, this kind of a virus. I mean, if you look at those genes that compose the virus, you have to assume, I guess, but the assumption is incorrect, but maybe it, it is, that they had to originate from another organism rather than the virus itself. And this thing is just adding on to its genome from other organisms. Is right, that a, right. Is that a, a, a proper thought pattern? Yeah, here? in fact, you can tell that some of the genes came from other sources. Right, so have they out, yeah. sorted that all out to make sure, to, to see the origins of the Mimi virus have multiple sources, and uh, do we know about that at all? I think it hasn't been all sorted out yet. Okay. I think it's hard to exactly pinpoint where they came from. Right. Because the homology is not great. So why have another virus has done this then? I think they have. So there are other Mimi like viruses sitting out there waiting to get well, discovered? Well, there's certainly a Mimi like. There's the Cafeteria Renbergensis ah, yes. Mimi like virus. Ah, yes. Um there are others as well that infect these large so they're they're called NCLDV nucleocytoplasmic large DNA containing viruses, <laughs> and a lot of them infect uh, algae in the oceans, for example. Oh yes. And poxes are also pox viruses right. are included in that as well. Right. And then there's a whole spectrum of kinds of amoebae. Yeah. All right. There's a, a whole set called radiolarians, for instance, that have these little beautiful spikes that come off from their sides. They build a little silicone, I believe it's out of silicone, test. It's called a test. Mm -hmm. They live inside. The test is another name for house. And if you go to the American Museum of Natural History, you can see them hand-blown glass replicas of these beautiful other kinds of uh, protozoans or protists. Mm -hmm. And it would be interesting to see what the host range for this virus is, not just a canth amoeba. I'm sure they're working on it. uh, You think? I would think so. I would do it. I would too. So it's 16% of the genome is lost. And they say other genomic losses happen with other DNA viruses. Again, these NCLDV members, pox viruses, African swine fever virus, chlorella viruses. Chlorella. Right. And they point out that um, for some of these, you see the same end loss ah. type of pattern. I think pox viruses were one where right. um, you see the ends get lost um, under under particular culture conditions. So another name for our episode could have been split ends. Isn't that a rock group? <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, it's actually what happens when you use the wrong shampoo. Is there, but isn't there a rock group called split ends? There might be. I think they were All named right. after this process. Then they say they looked at cafeteria renbergensis virus that has its own oh, yeah. virophage. And they say the confirmed genes are centrally, the orthologs are centrally located. Genes mm-hmm. unique to a species are located at the ends. So the ends seem to be recombinant, recombinogenic, and they pick up other genes from other sources. The, the location of the deletions support the hypothesis that this process is not random, but preferentially occurred in variable regions that are less subject to selective pressure than the central regions that can sit, contain core genes that are conserved. Cool stuff. They also mention that this happens in bacteria. Aha. Uh-huh. Salmonella enterica exhibits multiple and extensive genome reductions associated with the loss of metabolic and regulatory capabilities following serial allotypic cultures. Hmm. Marseille virus, that's the other one. Mimi virus and Marseille virus. So wild, wait a minute, wild-type bacteria maintain a larger genome than cultured bacteria? Well, in this case, salmonella in, in particular. Yeah, but there's no other cell in there. There's just salmonella. Yeah, but if you... So salmonella is not normally growing by itself. It's no. in your gut That's or true. wherever where there are lots of competitors, right, and other bacteria, yeah. viruses, parasites maybe. Who knows? So maybe it needs these other genes to compete successfully in a mixed yeah. culture. Yeah, that's one of the ideas they have here. Very these nice. These may be involved in competition. Very nice. I find it interesting that they lose these these fuzzy projections on the, on the capsid. Yeah. So maybe those yeah. have to do with competition. 
extra B. And they think that those allow the infected cells to be infected with virophages. So hmm. that suggests that the virophage has some real big role, as Alan said before, right. in nature. Right. Right. And the fibers, if, if the fibers are how the virophage gets in, then they must also be doing something for Mimi virus in order to be retained. Right. 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 Fibers are important in allowing the virophage to co infect. They also say these um, lost genes include fiber proteins, as we said, and genes involved in their glycosylation. And they say presumably these proteins are unnecessary when competition decreased during protist infection. Right. There are genes for glycosylation here? Yeah. Yeah. I thought glycosylation was a post-translational yeah. protein yeah. decoration it is. thing. But Mimi viruses actually pack their own some of their own glycosylation machinery, see, apparently. Mm -hmm. Is this an They're O is this an O or an N glycosylation? <laughs> I don't know, they don't say it here. <laughs> Is, is it important? It is, absolutely. Why, Dixon? Well, because it's an, it, some of it is antigenic in one configuration, and, mm -hmm. and in another configuration, it's not. So there's a ton of uh, data on this with regards to salmonella, particularly group D salmonella. Yeah. They make some weird uh, glycosylation arrangements that's shared by trichinella, so that's the reason why I would know about that. Well, there's a whole... There's a whole database for this, Dixon, the Carbohydrate Active Enzymes Database. Wow. CASI.org. Wow. And I will forward it to you so you can read it in your leisure. <laughs> okay, Dixon. I will use it as my uh, nighttime reading. The last thing is these uh, anchorin repeats. So genes, eukaryotic genes with anchorin repeats are found in many intracellular microorganisms, especially those living in amoeba like Legionella, wow. Coxiella, and rickettsia. I'll be darned. As well as viruses. Anchorin allows the organism to remain attached to the microfibrils? Mm, they the say. Microtubules, rather? I don't know. Okay. They don't mention what they might be doing. Okay, okay. But let's look it up. Hmm. Anchorin. Anchorin repeat is a 33 residue motif in proteins. They mediate protein-protein interactions and are among the most common structural motifs in known proteins. Right. They appear in bacterial, archaeal, and eukaryotic proteins, but are far more common in eukaryotes. Right. How about that? Yeah. So are they involved in microtubule assembly or...? Protein protein interactions. That's pretty broad, Dixon. It certainly is. So it could include <laughs> that. <laughs> right? It's a structural protein, so that, that narrows it down a little bit. Structural motifs in known proteins, not necessarily structural. Could oh, be okay. any kind of protein. Right, right. I just think of the cytoskeleton and stuff like that. And the last thing I want to mention here are results. Right. Apparently, just just Sorry. one other quick thing about the anchorin proteins. Apparently, maybe in Coxiella, um, they're involved in uh, um, inhibiting apoptosis. Mm hmm. Right. So it's mm -hmm. a way to keep the cell from killing itself after it gets infected. Which is important for viruses. Yes. Indeed. Some viruses. <clears throat> viruses that take a long time to reproduce. If the one for viruses that reproduce quickly, they can actually use apoptosis to get out. Right. So they don't have to inhibit it. How about that, Dixon? I, I'm amazed every time I sit here. <laughs> right. Well as long as as long as you've packaged your genome quickly enough that, that you've exactly. got some package before the shell the cell blows up. <laughs> I like this sentence. The genome reduction occurring in Mimi virus is reminiscent of the use it or lose it phenomenon, often proposed for intracellular bacterial evolution. That could be a title of this episode, too, right? We have a lot of good ones in this case. So loss of useless genes. Or that is, that's what's going on here. Or anchorins away. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. My boys. <laughs> anchorins away. So that's pretty cool. Nimi viruses, we're learning something new all the time. Yeah, exactly. And this is from the group in France that has been studying these viruses How for nice. some time. And I'm... The it's very appropriate. Mimi is a French name to begin with, so I think this is very, very nice. I hope you're right, because if they're listening, no, no. they're going to get mad at you. Uh, Maurice Chevalier once sang a song called Mimi. Is that, is that right? I believe so. First author is Michael Boyer, and the last is Didier Raoul. We also have other people who have been working on these viruses. And Michael Rossman, who is a crystallographer. And they've actually solved wow. the structure of these uh, wow. particles, showing that they're lacking the fibers and they're wow. just like osphedral particles. It's a pretty wow. cool piece of work. Check it out. Very nice. PNAS.
Any final thoughts, Dixon? None, except that it's good to see basic science research. This has nothing to do with disease process per se for human genes or human diseases. And yet they uh, obviously did a very thorough job in, uh, in identifying a problem, pursuing it, and answering it. Yeah, I'm impressed. Yeah, it's a neat paper. I'm impressed. You have to do basic science because you never know what is going to come out of it. You know what? We are all basic science no matter what, even though we're anthropocentric. All of all, you know, all of life impacts on ours. Listen to this. Speaking of health, yeah, I just want to read one more sentence. Another virophage called Sputnik Two was recently found to be associated with a giant virus isolated from liquid from a contact lens of a patient with keratitis. Uh huh. huh. Now, it's a catamoeba causes that. Yeah, so they got a virophage out of it. It does. Okay. In the old days, people used to use a drop of tap water. For their lenses, mm -hmm. and a canthamoeba insists in fresh water when the conditions are not right for its yeah, growth. Yeah, sure. And as soon as the lens goes on your eye, the temperature goes up to thirty-seven, and the boom, the amoeba exists, releasing Legionella and itself. And that's where you get these beautiful halo-like erosions of the uh, cornea. Nice. It's a Dixon. big. It's a bad disease, actually. Very good. So Bausch and Lomb came up with these sterile solutions for contact users. Well, so. see that they can have virophages, those amoeba. That's very. That's, that's probably what this person had keratitis yeah. from, right? So here's the connection to human disease, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, I guess they were looking sure. to see if these viruses do. No, we had a TWIP humans. letter. Excuse me for crossing over, no, but we had okay. a TWIP letter that wanted us to have actually have a, a big show about free living amoeba that can cause disease, Neglaria and Acanth amoeba, and this is one of them. Yeah, we should do it, Dixon. We have to do it now. Okay. It's compelling. Our second paper is equally compelling, I think. Okay. It is a paper in PLOS One called Temporal Analysis of the Honey Bee Microbiome oh. Reveals Four Novel Viruses and Seasonal Prevalence of Known Viruses Nosema and Crithidia. That's not a virus. What is it, Dixon? It's What's Crithidia? It's a micro... Crithidia is a protozoan... It's a trypanosome. It's related to trypanosomes. Yeah. I thought the, you were right, the, title, the title of the paper is Prevalence of Known Viruses, comma, Nosema, oh, comma, oh, comma, oh, and oh, 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 okay, and then <laughs> so all is the, forgiven. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sorry <laughs> if you misinterpreted. So Nosema is a microsporidian right. related to fungi because yep. of its 16 sRNA uh, pattern. There you go. So this is from the lab of Raul Andino and Joe DeRisi. First author is Charles Runkle. I, we had Raul last week on TWIV. Oh, sorry, I missed that. And Joe DeRisi, of course, is another virus discoverer. So what they have done here, we have talked actually about colony collapse disorder of honeybees before yes. on TWIV. Yes, and the latest have. one was number 104, the colony collapse blues. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and in that episode, we discussed a paper suggesting that the combination of an iridovirus and nosema was strongly uh, linked to the disorder. Right. Although now I hear, I read in this paper that <laughs> that study didn't hold up. Oh, well. well <laughs> it doesn't hold up in this paper either. So they're still searching. Now, I didn't know that there are migratory beekeeping operations. Oh, gosh, yes. I didn't know it's that. Huge, oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. So these Multi guys have hives and they move them all around the country. Yeah, they winter over in, in Texas and then they huh. move them all over the Whoever place. Whoever needs it. Or, or in this case, Mississippi. It's a billion dollar industry, basically. I mean, so these guys. These are, these are big operations. In fact, in this paper, they um, <laughs> yeah. they worked with one. They call it a typically managed uh, large scale migratory beekeeping operation with more than seventy thousand hives. Here, here. How do they move those around on trucks? Truck. Yeah. And the bees go back to the hive at some point so they can close them up and put them on a truck. They do. Yep. So it says here that the pollination industry in the U.S. is valued at fifteen billion dollars a is year. Correct. That is all the fruit trees, for instance, all of the fruit trees in California and all of the everywhere. blueberries that grow in Maine and uh, throughout uh, North America. They're all pollinator-driven. Well, I, this may be underappreciated by most people. There are other things that can pollinate. I mean, bees and ants and yeah. wasps and that sort of thing. So but basically, Dixon, you cannot depend on natural pollination. 
Uh, if you want to make money, you can't. <laughs> <laughs> right. At the scale of most um, most modern agriculture, you just can't get it done if you're waiting for the occasional bumblebee to happen into your field. Here, here. But it all depends on the kind of crop you're growing. So sure. you, you get these these uh, mobile guys, and they put their hives yep. right next to your crops. You got it. Open them up, and the bees have a field day. Bingo. Okay. Literally. <laughs> Literally, really. That's right. That's <laughs> yeah, and these bees, um, it's not just going to one or two to to like one other place they um they yeah. have this map where they're showing them being trucked from mississippi to south dakota and then to yeah. california that's right and that's, that's right. the cycle of their year to, of, to pollinate different crops along there's the a way. lot of stress in all of this i mean one of the most popular brands of honey is called orange blossom honey and guess where those bees go to do that of course california and florida mm -hmm. for sure. the yeah. for the orange industry so, Do they really? Because there yeah. are also commercial honey operations yeah. that essentially force feed the bees. Force feed the bees. They just they just provide a pool of nectar and um, oh, or, or or syrup, right, uh, for the bees to feed on, and it it makes it simpler because it's not moving around. Got it. So I know some of these pollinating operations probably don't even bother to collect the honey. Yeah, well, that might be right. Anyway. So the, the the object of this work is to try and get some information about colony collapse. And what they said yeah. was, we have to really know what is in bees. What's the total microbiome in yes, bees? Yes, yes, yes. So they took they followed a uh, migrating honeybee um, operation yep. throughout a period of time and took regular samples. Mm -hmm. And they said this colony didn't actually have colony collapse, but it would tell you what's in them. Right. And then you can start looking for these and look for correlations. Sure. So they started this work after 2007. So they, this was a typical migratory operation, 70,000 hives. And they monitored it for 10 months. Right. Honeybees from 20 colonies were consistently sampled beginning with um, April 2009 in Mississippi through transport to South Dakota and then to California. And then, you know, you can imagine all the things they're exposed to during that, stresses and antibiotic sure, treatments sure, and sure, so forth. Sure. The thing I'm a little bit confused about here is that colony collapse syndrome is typified by, or characterized, I should say, by the fact that the bees at one point go out to forage and they never come back. Mm -hmm. So right. how would you sample the cause of that if they never come back? Well, presumably the ones in the hive are getting ready to leave and they have whatever it is that Yeah, it's an interesting assumption. Well, that's a problem. I was talking to Raul last week, and he said it's a bit problematic when the ones that are dying yeah, exactly. disappear. You can't sample exactly them. Right. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, but yeah, that's the way it is. Huh. So um, they used three different approaches here. They use a microarray, an arthropod pathogen microarray, APM, cool. Cool. So looking at all known pathogens of arthropods. Mm, and there are lots. Plenty. And different kinds of PCR, and then deep sequencing to find out new ones. So the microarray will find what you know. Right. And the PCR you can use to monitor yeah, yeah. and quantitate, and then the um, deep sequencing will find new stuff. This is a big study. Yeah. It's a lot of samples. Who, who funded this? I don't know. Let's see who funded If it's a $15 billion industry, boy. The Dixon de Pommier <laughs> Foundation. No, no, the bee's knees. I think the... <laughs> the bee's knees. <laughs> that, that might be the title of this also. The bee's knees, yeah. The bee's knees. I'm still scrolling. Acknowledgements. It doesn't say who funded it. I can't find it anyway. Oh, here we go. No, nope, that's data. I don't know who funded it. Okay. I don't want to take any more time. All right, all right. Just ask this question here. It's a good question. Not who who would you think would fund it? Uh, well, I think, you know, the National Beekeepers Association or some large agricultural group with a vested interest in the answers. It thanks the National Beekeeper, that's the San Francisco Beekeepers Association, for assistance with sampling. Right. It doesn't thank anyone for money. And mm. Breta D and the staff at a D Honey Farms. You know, um, yeah. there's no money, which is usually given at the end of the paper. It's exactly. So I don't know. Anyway, so we have these three sam these three sampling techniques, mm -hmm. which they validated, and then they did temporal monitoring, right? Because right. they took samples over time. They have these wonderful pictures mm. of uh, what was detected when. Right. So they had ten month time course, four hundred and thirty one data points, each consisting of fifty to one hundred bees. 
separated from the entrance and the inside. Right. So they have the older foragers. Right. That's you and I, Dixon. <laughs> and the brood comb, the younger house bees. Ah, yes. Maybe that's Alan. I don't know. No, I'm, I'm a little past the brood comb. <laughs> You're a little long in the stinger, as it were. Yeah. <laughs> so they found a lot of nosema infections. Right. Okay. Yeah. That's, that was there quite a bit. But they didn't encounter, encounter any collapse. No collapses. Right. So all of this is normal background. Yeah, that's it. That's the point. Normal background. Yeah. Viruses they found, lots of known viruses, right. sac brood virus, bee queen virus, et cetera. Yeah, they yeah. found all those. Yep. But they and say that, that they didn't find them all that often. Yes. And they also found four new viruses. They found new, four new viruses by deep sequencing, right? And the first one is called aphid lethal paralysis virus, strain Brookings. Previously not been reported in honeybees. But in aphids, yes. Is that right? Well, apparently. Dixon, you're brilliant. <laughs> no, I'm not. I just read the word. <laughs> so it says further investigation is needed to determine whether this virus is a honeybee pathogen. Yeah, well, aphids and honeybees have nothing biologically in common. They're except, both well, wait a minute, except that they both make honey. True. But aphids are in a totally new group compared then they have, to the bees. Then they have Big Sioux River virus, a dicystrovirus. These are RNA viruses with two open yeah, reading frames related to the pocornas. And uh, 28 incidences were detected from 197 time course samples by PCR. Hmm. Lake Sinai virus strain 1 and 2. It's a new virus as well. A lot of these viruses. In fact, a lot of viruses are named after the places they're isolated from, yes? Mm -hmm. Yes, that's what these names are. Even human viruses. Seven of 20 hives sampled in August 2009 were positive for LSV1. Hmm. So... You know, and so they say the abundance of these two viruses, Lake Sinai 1 and 2, suggests they may be pathogens, but they don't know based right, on this study. Right. And then Dixon. What? They, since they are deep sequencing, yes. they found a protozoan, Crithidia mellificae. Okay. A bumblebee pathogen. A mellificae is, is, is refers to the, uh, Sorry. the genus Bombi. name. Crithidia bombi is a bumblebee pathogen. Yes, that's right. Mellifilae is the gene, is the species name for apis. They actually dissected out the honeybee intestines and looked at the trypanosomids in the intestines, Dixon. Very they have, cool. They have pictures of them here. Now, you know, See, it, look. it raises an interesting question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but before you go on, Dixon, I just want to make one more uh, comment. Ahead. These crithidia were found at almost in almost every month, every month according to this uh, so chart. So these are plant pathogens, all right? Cr what, the crithidia? Yeah. Yeah. There, they're they're particularly prevalent in milkweed-like plants. Mm -hmm. Right, there's one called Crithidia fasciculata, which is used as a model organism for primitive trypanosomes. So these bees must be foraging all over the place and taking pollen from all kinds of plants. So that's very interesting because you maybe know, that's you, how it gets into the bees. Well, right? you're looking at honeybees as a commercial yeah, venture. Sure. And, you know, please go out and, and pollinate those, those uh, blueberry bushes. But at the same time, they're pollinating lots of other things, too. So well, every field is going to have some weeds. Uh, and every field has cross-pollination from other sure. fields, so to speak. <laughs> I think that's where we probably got that analogy to begin with. But yeah. it's, it's fascinating to see what the honeybees picked up from non-commercial crops. Has, yeah. that, that's just the point of it. Yeah, they say that this crithidia was found in every time point in every geographic location. So, and it can, so it can't have anything to do with the commercial crops. This has, has something to do with a wild plant. Cool. Okay. So milkweed is found everywhere. Okay. Do, by the way, do you know which organism is totally dependent on milkweed for its biology? Nope. Monarch butterflies? Thank you. Oh. Bingo. Oh. Hey, nice. <laughs> you're moving, absolutely moving right. Moving on, Dixon. Spiroplasma. <laughs> oh, it's all connected, Vince. We have to connect all these yeah, dots. It's okay. Spiroplasma, they found. Spiroplasma. What is that? A relative of mycoplasma. Oh, okay. Bacterial parasites that have been implicated as pathogens ah, of insects, vertebrates, and plants. They're not bacteria, Vince. So they found them. They, cause, they say here, mycoplasma are bacterial parasites. What do you call them, Dixon? My, they're mycoplasma. They're bacteria. Well, they have no cell wall. Neither do you. <laughs> That's right. 
These are probably in a class all themselves. It's a genus of bacteria, Dixon. Yeah, I know that, but I, if you look at their structure, they have almost <laughs> nothing in common with bacteria. Okay. That's why the archaea were separated. Here, here. Anyway, yeah, taxonomists they, like to fight over mycoplasma. Yeah, they do. They do. Thank you for rescuing me from this embarrassing situation. It's not embarrassing. <laughs> and the final thing we mentioned that they found is the forid fly, P-H-O-R-I-D. Yeah. Previously associated with bumblebee parasitism. Recently described as a parasite of honeybees in San Francisco Bay Area. Interesting. So what happens is the flies lay eggs inside the insect, oh, yeah. which are then consumed by the larvae. Yummy. Sounds wonderful, doesn't it? It's a parasitic fly. And like an alien. So this is the well, first... All the wasps do that. <laughs> all the, all the, a lot of the wasps do that, A yeah. lot of them do it. And Wolbachia is involved in this infection, by the way. Which, so which infection? This forward fly Well, infection? a lot of the... No, a lot of the... Um, the wasps. Parasitic wasp infections carry uh, Wolbachia with them as well. So it's, it would be interesting to see if they could isolate Wolbachia from any of these bumblebees. Or any of these honeybees, rather. Yeah, maybe it's been done. Maybe. Anyway, this is the first report of forid flies in honeybee samples outside of California. But they looked for all the organisms here, and they didn't detect any Wolbachia. Yeah, they did, I, they would have picked it up in their, exactly, in their screens. Exactly. Yes. So it's unusual mm -hmm. that they didn't find it because of its ubiquity in nature. Maybe it would make you resistant to colony collapse. Hey. I'm just speculating. <laughs> all right, so the thing here is that now you have sort of the baseline of... Yeah. Of microbes. So right? where do you go from here? Uh, you have to use specific probes and look uh, in, in in colonies with the disease, right? Uh, well, you know, it's funny because which disease do you look for, and how do you know if your colony's in disease process until they disappear? We didn't well, I think what you what you have to do is keep this study going or something like it until you catch some colonies different. that collapse, right? And see what's yeah. different in those. It sounds like storm chasers. You know, I watch that on the Discovery Channel a lot. And they, they look at these Doppler radar views of the clouds and what they're forming, and occasionally they get a tornado and occasionally they don't. And in this case, you're looking for the perfect storm for a disease that's about to happen, but it hasn't happened yet. So right. how, how can you be more defined in the way you look to make sure that you're not going to waste your time just looking at the normal? Yeah. By the way, we didn't mention Nosema. I, I skipped over it. No, you mentioned Did the I, title. They, they yeah. found it in yeah, 20 Nosema. colonies. Yeah. In April and May, yep. it was kind of seasonal, but undetected in pooled monthly samples. Right. And they say they're not sure what's the story with Nosema because yeah. remember that other paper said Nosema plus iridovirus yeah, together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But they say variables Nosema prevalence and abundance at both the apiary and individual colony level indicate that standardized molecular biology-based monitoring is needed to understand the dynamics right. of infection. So, you know... If if they were suggesting that iridovirus plus uh, nosema is the cause of colony collapse, you could actually carry that experiment out in the laboratory. Yeah, well, sure. It, yeah, exactly. So did they? Yeah. I, you know, in that last uh, twiv where we talked about this, they did. Yeah, I they, believe they did, and and I don't remember the result. <laughs> it must have been an exciting result. I, I, I let me just say I'm not sure we even went over it. I'm okay. not sure they're doing All right. it. I'd have to go back and look. Okay. But they're saying here that that was followed up by a second study, which didn't confirm the association of the two. So they're, right. they're yeah, kind it's of that old, it's that old correlation yeah. versus causality problem. And they exactly. found they, here they didn't find any iridovirus sure. involvement. Sure, so they they say that honeybee colonies are under a constant cycle of viral infection. Yeah, yeah. and some right. of them may be problematic, and others may be fine. I read right. an article also that says just the stress of transportation is enough to push them over the edge. So they didn't detect any iridovirus. In this study. Yeah. And, and they also didn't detect any colony collapse. Right. Yes. That's exactly. significant, right? Yep. Yeah, but this, um, what this study does and what they apparently set out to do, from what I understand, is it, it exactly as you said, it establishes the baseline. Yeah. It says this is what the normal microbiology of these commercial honeybee operations looks like because nobody had determined that. Mm -hmm. So to a large extent, a lot of these studies were going around and kind of groping blind at different things and saying, well, you know, we found this virus or we found this uh, this parasite in these bees, but is that normal? Right. right. And now you can look at this study and refer sure. back to it and say, well, okay, this is normal. You see these seasonal cycles in Nosema. You see yeah, yeah. these viruses in there. Um, and then you would go at this point now and, and look for abnormal things. Yes. Of course, this doesn't, this is just one 
operation of, of uh, migratory bee colonies in one season. Yeah, that's so right. It's not necessarily representative, but it gives a starting point. Sure. And another thing is that, uh, you know, I <laughs> it's hard for me to make a prediction that's come true because the last time I tried this was for the... Uh, the uh, influenza outbreak that occurred in Mexico that eventually spread all over the world. <laughs> and I said, probably isn't going to result in anything. So it shows you just how much you know. But, you know, the SARS epidemic came up like all of a sudden out of nowhere and then disappeared all of a sudden out of nowhere. But we're afraid it might come back, but it, it hasn't yet. So maybe the colony collapse syndrome, is it still ongoing? What's the status of it right now? How many bee colonies are we losing a year? Um, what is the threat from next year's climate change issues that, you know, Alan and I both lament the fact that uh, we haven't seen the sun in a while. Uh, if you live in South Dakota, you haven't seen your house in a while because it's underwater. Um, and all and of not these, just the mortgage. And not just the mortgage, exactly right. So, I mean, lots of things are going on now that uh, could affect the outcome of a lot of these infections in, in the next year. Are we worried about colony collapse syndrome wiping out the beekeeping industry? And the answer was, in the beginning we were, but it appears that it's still a viable industry. So what effect has this really had on beekeeping? Because I know bees die regularly along the way. I'm, I visited a bee colony about uh, a week ago on the rooftop of um, an architecture firm in Brooklyn. They're keeping bees in New York City, as, as you know. And there were tons of dead bees around this, this beehive. And I said, good Lord, you've looks like you're suffering from colony collapse syndrome. And they said, oh, no, 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 bees die all the time around you. If you, if you don't have a grass lawn and your beehive is on, the, let's say, a cement pedestal and they're flying off the rooftop to, to pollinate flowers all over the place, bees die all the time around the hive. But in ordinary situations, you don't see them because the ants take them up and, you know. But here on this rooftop, there mm -hmm. were thousands of dead bees all over the place. So... Vince, you look like you're reading something important there. Well, Jim, our friend in Virginia, just sent us an article in the New York Times today. It's called Blessed Are the Beekeepers. Uh -huh. New York Times, June 22nd, by Randall Rooker and Walter Thurman. Rooker is a, professional, a professor of agricultural economics at Montana State. Thurman is a professor of agricultural and resource economics at North Carolina State. Right. And they said, even though we have colony collapse, 30% yep. of the U.S. honeybees alive in the fall, failed to survive to pollinate blossoms in the spring, yet this is a burgeoning migratory pollinating industry, and we have not had any less fruits in the U.S. Yeah, as a consequence. Right. That's right. The increase has not translated into fewer springtime bees, is what they say. There are just as many bees, yeah. so they're saying maybe this is not a big deal. Maybe colony collapse is another word for senescence. We can be grateful that CCD has had no measurable, let alone drastic, effects on the availability of fruits, vegetables, nuts, and honey. Beekeepers has been, have been as busy as well as oh. their iconic insect partners to bring this about. Or beavers. <laughs> yeah, so we'll put a link to that so you can see as well. Right. And my guess is in nature, if the bee colonies collapse, something else will come in to take its place. Dif Dixon, if we destroy the Amazon rainforest, will something make the oxygen that was previously made there? No, we'll all have to move to Mars at that point, okay. I think. Right, but bees are one species, I think, was Dixon's yeah. point. Yeah, but yeah. ants and beetles and uh, hummingbirds and all kinds of other things, squirrels, you name it. There's a whole bunch of organisms out there that to participate in the um, the process of pollination. Beetles in particular, by the way, and there are over well, 450,000 species of beetles. But you just said earlier that you can't rely on other species to pollinate your crops. I didn't not say that. No, no, but we're not talking about, in this case, I'm not talking about crops. I'm just talking about Oh, yeah, that's nature. fine. But we're, here we're saying, in this article, they're saying the crops are fine. Understood. So the pollinators yeah. are working. Yeah. No, they are. I don't know. They are. You know, I'm not in the industry. If we have some beekeepers listening... Please but, weigh in. But I guarantee you that even in those commercial situations, other organisms are contributing to the pollination formula, particularly low bushberry, blueberries in Maine. Mm -hmm. Ants would be a, a logical candidate for this because they love pollen just like the bees. Because, by the way, they're sure. related. They're both in the, I believe they're... Ants and bees? Yeah, ants and bees. Are they're in both hymenoptera. Yep. Thank you, thank you. Hymenoptera is what I'm All right, for. let's close with two points. One? Yes. This uh, Lake Sinai virus was the most abundant single component of the honeybee microbiome in this study. Huh. And it's because it's new. No one had a probe for it before, so we never knew about this. So right. they say it'll be interesting to look at this. 
Right. They also say we're doing research to determine the potential pathogenicity of these four new viruses in right. honeybees. So right. to answer your question. Okay. And finally, in closing, they say this is the first U.S. honeybee pathogen monitoring study to report both comprehensive pathogen incidence and relative abundance of specific pathogens over time. Cool. Just to emphasize that this is important study. Tell me again where the authors are from. The authors? University of San Franc- California, San Francisco. Howard Hughes Medical Institute, Bethesda, Maryland. Aha. Uh, UCSF, UCSF, well, and yeah. yeah, well, UCSF, and then the Hughes. Great, because this would be a great uh, thing for the USDA to fund, by the way, because yeah. this is really something very important for the agricultural industries of the United States. Okay, there you go. Yep, great picks, Vince. Uh, the uh, first one was sent. The um, Mimi virus was sent to me by Saul Silverstein. Ah. Oh. Thank you, Saul. A neighbor. And the second one, I think I, I don't remember. I think I saw it somewhere. It's been on the list for a while. What do you say we answer a few emails? Cool. Sure. All right. First, before we do, I have to clarify something. Mm-mm. I made a mistake on podcast number 136, which was called Exit XMRV. I said that the CWR22 xenograft was done at the Cleveland clinic but i was wrong it was done at case western reserve university close (laughs) yes i know that geographically they're they're right next (laughs) door yes i'm sorry it was my error and this is the original human prostate tumor put into mice Uh which eventually picked up xmrv it wasn't done at case at at, uh, cleveland clinic it was done at case western reserve cwru which are in the initials in fact of the tumor so my apologies for misspeaking we have an email from Norma. Some time ago, I emailed you about transcribing an episode of TWIV and have finally finished episode 60. Let me join the chorus of appreciative listeners in praise for your podcast. I've learned a lot from it. I was inspired by your generosity to give something back, so please find attached a Word document with a transcript of one of the TWIV 101s. Cool. Hey. I do work in science, but not specifically in science writing, so I hope it doesn't have too many mistakes. <laughs> Thanks again to you and your fellow Twivists. We'll just give it to an RNA editor. That's up on the site already. <laughs> Thank you, Norma, for doing that. Anybody just splice else? it into the show notes. Exactly. Splice it in. <laughs> Anybody wants to do a transcript, you're welcome. Yeah. Peter writes, Peter is from Sydney, Australia. After listening to Alan's pick of the artful amoeba, I went to the site and noticed something that you guys may have missed. Hmm. The diagram showing amoeba structures has an organelle labeled Plans for World Domination. (laughs) I did not miss that. I I certainly noticed that the first time I did the site. He writes, what a cracker. Great pick. Keep up the good work, etc., etc. Insert platitudes here. Want to insert a platitude? No, nothing, but the Amoebae had their shot some two billion years ago, and they blew it, so I don't know. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. I wouldn't really say they blew it. <laughs> well, they're still here, aren't they? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> hey, Dixon, they found their niche. Oh, they did, they did, they did. P.S. I'm going to steal Dick's dihydroxy chicken wire line <laughs> Good. <laughs> that he quipped on one of the twips. Please. I like dihydroxy chicken wire. I did, too, when I heard it first. I was enthralled. John writes, thanks for reading my question. I'm glad you guys seemed at least somewhat interested in covering the near future of virology. I think one reason it would be a particularly interesting discussion is that while young at heart, the hosts are generally experienced scientists and in one case has moved to emeritus status. I guess that's you, Dixon. I guess it's me. This gives a unique perspective as to what the next generation of the field may be looking towards. Mm. Unfortunately, in the popular media, most discussion of the future of science is either at the extreme speculative level of 50 years in the future <laughs> right, or silly commercial applications of basic science. Right. While that's good for fiction, it's not as interesting as looking at what scientists think are important issues or research opportunities that will or should be explored in the near to midterm future. Thanks again for a wonderful series of podcasts. P.S. Yes, I am part of the Alan Dove fan club. All right. Aw, shucks. <laughs> it's got a high membership fee. <laughs> <laughs> we had He had suggested we do a show on the future of virology, Dixon. Well. And we will do it. 
as soon I, as we can think of something. I will be the straight man for this too, because <laughs> well, our our predictions have been so reliable in the past. Uh, exactly, exactly, exactly. It's hard enough to predict the past. Yeah. All right, Eric writes. I discovered Twiv lot, not long ago and have suffered a virulent, excuse the pun, <laughs> case of virology mania ever since. Oh, good. From what I've heard so far on Twiv, I am not alone in this. That being the case, I can only hope my questions are not victims of severe repetition by other submissions to TWIV. Being merely an ill-informed, yet viciously curious teenager, I can't help but ask the obvious questions. Anyways, in my limited so far research, it has come to my attention that the exact origin of our tiny infectious friends are as of yet unknown. According to my findings, the primary speculations are as follows. One... Viruses arose from non-living matter, distinct yet parallel to other forms of life. Two, they are the result of more complex life forms having become a sort of parasite to host cells and losing much of their functions as a result. Three, arose as parts of cell genomes and acquired the ability to separate from the host and infect others. Why is this so? How is it that after several hundred years of scientific breakthroughs within <laughs> microbiology that we still cannot pinpoint the origin of viruses? Is this one of the irrelevant questions best left to abiogenesis? If you could touch on these three speculations a little and perhaps introduce your own, it would be much appreciated. As I said before, my scientific knowledge is limited. However, my newfound appreciation and excitement for this field is not. I find it astounding that such an amazing world is hiding right under our noses, and the average person only goes as far as where and when the next flu shot can be obtained. I'm starting my first college classes in the fall, and I have a feeling that I will not regret my choice in choosing biology as my major thanks in part to TWIV. Keep up the great work. Wow. That was awesome. an amazing letter from a teenager. Well, he's 18. Well, just, just heading off to college. Good yeah. Lord. Viruses arose from non-living matter, hmm. distinct yet parallel to other forms of life. What do you say, Dixon? Well, you want me to stick my neck out? That's yeah, I no do. problem. I do. Um, my... my my impression of viruses has always been that they are opportunist parasites that take advantage of living systems. And so you can't be a parasite unless there's a living system there to take advantage of. So I think viruses arose from living entities that had their own lifestyle and little bits and pieces broke off through mistakes and replication, et cetera, et cetera. But the reason why they're still here, in my view, is because they're incredibly essential and useful for lateral transfer of genes, not vertical like we would through division and sex and all that stuff, but lateral transfer. So if you want you know, the, the analogy, you've got this guy on the corner with a big trench coat and he opens it up and he says, want to buy a watch? the virus opens up the cell and says, want to buy a cellular function. And so therefore, I think once the viruses arose and the usefulness in terms of, of um, I guess it's fast-forwarding evolutionary process became apparent, which was the first virus ever to do this, nature said, hey, that's a good thing, let's keep them and let's just keep making more of them based on this initial model. That's my view. My view is... Not that they're useful, but that they exist for the same reason most life exists, all life exists, which right. is that they can. Yeah. Um, so they're, they're successful parasites because they escape being eliminated and rendered extinct. Um, and that's all they have to do. And I, I kind of favor the idea of viruses arising as parts of cell genomes, the, mm -hmm. the third mm -hmm. explanation. Um, although the possibility that some of them might have started out as uh, as parasites of other types and then lost progressively lost things, um, it, you know that's that's also viable. As far as the question of why these questions are are unaddressed, they are fundamentally hard questions to address. Um, nobody was there at the time. There's no fossil record, and the and the uh, the record that we have is in the viral <laughs> genomes, which yeah. are too small and cryptic to give us a good answer. I have yeah. a, I have a question yeah. on that level. If you had a piece of amber that you could post date back to, let's say, fifty million years ago, which you can do, uh, and you can find things in it like insects, and you can extract them, can you do enough DNA sequencing to see whether there are any viruses in them? Has that been 
I think it's been tried, but I don't know what the uh, results were. The, the pro, well, you can if they're endogenous viruses in the insect genome, you could find them. Yeah, but the particles are, are probably too unstable. Okay, but to have, have is there any evidence that viruses existed fifty million? Years yeah, ago? of course. Okay, so there's if you look at the endogenous viruses, which are in genomes of animals, you can date the uh, viruses to 100, 150 million years ago at least. Okay, That's so. very routinely done. But you can't go much earlier than that right. because you're using phylogeny of species as a guide yeah. you know, to put yeah. you yeah. on the map. As you say, you can't, go very, you can't go back to the origin of life, so you have no, no. idea. No. So there are lots of theories, and I can put a link to an interesting paper yeah. about this idea of the various <laughs> theories of origin. But as Alan says, you can't actually look. I mean, Vince, when you look at the T phages... Yeah, and their structure. You become a creationist at this point. No, no, you're not supposed to say that word. Somebody got mad at you, remember? Well, it's hard to believe that this thing arose by an evolutionary process. I don't see the intermediates of this thing, but I know that they're there. It's someplace. very easy to see how it arose. Well, there, there are many, many theories about. But they're incredibly beautifully structured. They look like a lunar lander module. All right. Yeah, okay. but you do you do kind of see the intermediates um, if you go from, or at least potential intermediates. Devil, uh, devil's advocate here, by the way. Yeah, we still have this. we still have transposons. Yeah. Um, and it's not a huge leap to go from a transposon that can encode a couple of unique proteins sure. to a transposon that can encode a capsid. No question. Um, and then why is the capsid such a beautiful icosahedral shape? Well, because that's the shape that works. Yeah, yeah that's right. Um, and I, you know, the the key thing that's missing from when when people say, oh, that couldn't possibly have evolved, um, I, I think what they're missing is the astonishing lengths of time we're talking yeah, about that's, here. Yeah, that's that's because it's exactly. it's very very difficult for humans to conceptualize four billion years. <laughs> or, um, or and and even as a biologist, I mean, it's always been hard for yeah, me to yeah. imagine that kind of time frame. The um, the closest I've come to being able to picture it was a, a few years ago. Uh, my wife and I went out west. We went hiking, and um, you know, hiking in the east is a lot of fun. But everything's covered with vegetation, so you don't see the rocks. Right. But out west, you go someplace like Bryce or Zion, and, oh. and you've got these these rock formations, and there's there's stuff <laughs> growing on them, but it's so small that you can't see it, and, and mm -hmm. it's just these these incredible formations. And at one point, we were going up a, a trail alongside a cliff. And um, I could see, I, right next to me, scraping against my shoulder, was this cliff wall. And so I could see the minute layers mm -hmm. next to me that, that I, I could actually look at. And if I'd had a microscope, I could have gone and I realized right. this was right. really, really tiny layers that represented years of accumulation of sediment. Sure. And then I turned my head. 20 degrees, and I was looking out over the canyon at this this massive accumulation of <laughs> thousands of feet of those microscopic layers. Here, here. And I said, yeah, that's geological time. <laughs> <laughs> that's, what, that's the amount of time that was allowed for this to happen. Sure, sure. So, I, yeah, I, I mean, I was just being jocular when I mentioned but the yeah. word. So, anyway, all three of these are possibilities in... Yeah. Can't sort. Uh, my um, pick this week has something to do with this, so stay tuned, Eric. Uh, the next one is from Benjamin. I am a recent communications graduate from the University of Washington. In my last quarter of school, I discovered TWIV, and I realized that I had gone and earned the wrong degree. <laughs> I enjoyed creating photos and writing marketing copy, but I have found thanks in part to Vincent's triad of podcasts that microbiology is what I really should have gone to school for. Unfortunately, I'm now sitting here with a degree in a field that is saturated, and even the odd internship at the local public relations or marketing firm is next to impossible to snag thanks to the down economy, economy and an extremely competitive market. What are my options as a non-science degree holder to at least associate myself with a research or laboratory environment? I'm 24 years old with a z with zero debt and a decent GPA, so re-entering school isn't out of the question, but my old advisor and several trusted sources have been trying to dissuade me from attempting to earn a post back. Are there options for someone trained in communications to work with companies involved in microbiology that don't involve being a pharmaceutical sales representative? Should attempting to pursue a microbiology post back in spite of my people's advice 
against doing so? Are there other options or avenues that I just haven't considered? I know I'm asking a lot, and I would appreciate any feedback. Even if you pass over my email, I want to let you guys know that I appreciate what you have done to make advanced science accessible to the odd photographer. I've even managed to hook a few of my friends. This democratization of information that you are spearheading is really a wonderful and exciting thing. Wow. Alan, take it. Well, <laughs> I guess having kind of gone a little bit in the other direction. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, I, I would say, you know, 24, no debt, decent GPA. You have all of your options open to you. Indeed. Um, don't listen to people who tell you that you can't go back to school or you shouldn't go back to school. Um, if you need a job right now, and that's a major issue, look around at getting a job as a lab technician. Huh. Um, you can, you, you don't necessarily have to have a biology or related degree to get a, a job working as a tech in somebody's lab, you know, ordering the supplies and um, doing some some other chores. It's not high paying and it's not prestigious, but that would put you in the environment. Um, and it would also give you direct exposure to what real science looks like. So if you just graduated from University of Washington, I'm guessing you're probably somewhere in the vicinity. Um, and you might want to call up and see if there are jobs for lab technicians that are open and go and uh, and make a nuisance of yourself, you know, see, <laughs> if, uh, see if you can get one of those jobs. Um, so that's one option. And another is, of course, go back to school and uh, and do some kind of post-baccalaureate program. The, the post-bac programs that I'm aware of are mostly tailored toward pre-med. Right. Um, which I don't know if that's something that... Um, that Ben, Benjamin's thought about, but that's a possibility. Um, or you could, uh, you know, talk to the the biology department, maybe at Uni University of Washington, and see what they have to say about courses that you would need to add in order to go on and um, and maybe go on into graduate school. Right. As Rich Condit says, go wash some dishes. Yeah, that's true. Show well, up at a lab. Tell them you want to. Yeah, I would definitely go for it. You're not too old. Of course not. You can, I would do as Alan says, I would get a job as a lab tech. Um, you can just wash dishes. You can order. Just get you in a lab and you start moving up to where you can do experiments because you don't have biology background, so it'll be more difficult to get that kind of position. But um, volunteer maybe if you can and just see what it's like. See if you like it. Um, if you're in the Seattle area, I know people there. Yeah, I can give you some leads that you can follow up to see if there's some jobs available. But um, you should work in a lab to see where you can tape it from there. You know, you may not want to do research, but as you say, you could work for companies and other, um, um, what's the word I'm looking for, in other... Mm, ancillary. Not ancillary, and <laughs> other... Related. Uh, I don't know. You don't have to do research. There are other ways to do it. But not, having worked in a lab will really help you. Well, I was going to suggest also that NSF has these fellows that they offer uh, positions for in Washington to uh, get involved in a variety of different activities. None of them are hands-on science, but some of them are science communications. And that's why I said take it, Alan, because I thought maybe you were going to head him off in that direction. Uh, well, those fellowships are... It's generally at people who are scientists who want to do something else. Yeah, yeah but so people who moved in my direction, there are there are fellowships for people who want to go into journalism and for those who want to go into public policy, especially. So the opposite, though, this guy's got lots of talent in communications now. And yeah. what if he were to take night courses at the University of Washington in biology, and at the same time get a job at a science magazine writing science articles? Um. A job at a science magazine writing science articles is like sub editor. Very, no, a sub editor. You start first. Uh, like that's washing the dishes for the science journals. <laughs> on another occasion, I can go into what's going on in the um, in the media industry. But I, <laughs> okay, okay. I would not. I would not flee marketing to go into that. <laughs> Let's just put it. That so way. it's back to the lab with you then. <laughs> yeah, I would say I. I, I would still stay. Um, go yeah. with a lab job. Yeah. If you love that. And right. I, 
wasn't it David Baltimore who said, if you if you can't imagine yourself doing anything else, then you should do science. Uh, <laughs> yeah. you know, if you if you get into a lab environment and you start to figure out that this is really what you want to do with your life, then that's what you should do with your life. Sure. Um, if you get into a lab environment and you think, wow, you know, the science is really cool, but I don't know if I'd really want to to be doing it. I might want to be explaining it. Um, then maybe take a couple of biology courses and start looking for jobs in public relations departments, um, not as sales representative, but in um, like public relations type jobs at yeah. universities or at companies. Okay. And then. by the way, uh, Benjamin, I just took a quick look at your website and uh, gorgeous photos. Yeah, very nice. I'm just you have a definite now. talent at that, whether you Absolutely. want to do it or not. <laughs> yeah, remember... Um, uh, Elliot Porter worked for Hans Sinzer for right. 25 years at Harvard before he became yeah. the world's best color photographer. Maybe this guy will go the time. other direction, Dixon. So, yeah, maybe. Okay, the last one I will just mention from Ben, who gives us hints how to convert Fahrenheit to centigrade. <laughs> it's a longish email where he lays out all the steps. And uh, we'll post that for those of you interested. And we should read it so we can quickly convert. Right. For example, Dixon, 50 degrees Fahrenheit is 10 degrees centigrade. That's right. Signposts or guideposts. No, I always use body temperature, you know, 37 versus 98.8 <laughs> and freezing and uh, boiling. I yeah, use those I've, three and then everything else is integrated in between there. Exactly. I, I remember I remember zero uh, yeah. 37 yeah. and a couple of others. 25 is room temperature. Boiling. And, um, <laughs> and six, 16 is about average earth temperature. Yeah. yeah. Uh, an underground cave or something. That's and right. four degrees feels like a cold room. That's your refrigerator. And minus 20 is your freezer. There you go. So that's, you know, that's enough. <laughs> that's enough guide points. That's um, right. But there's that's this right. other chart that he came up with based on uh, on numbers that's pretty good too. Yep. All right, Dixon, I understand you have a pick of the week for I do. us. I do, I do. It's a book that just recently came out. It was reviewed in Science Magazine, and it's called Inside Jokes. It's called Using Humor to Reverse Engineer the Mind. And basically what it says, and we've, we've actually read a part of this to each other and, and laughed at some and didn't laugh at others, the book is filled with all kinds of jokes. And there, are, there are obviously... Jokes that surprise, jokes that you can sense the ending for, that you still laugh at, jokes that you sense the ending for and you don't laugh at them. Um, and these all, all of them, though, have one effect on your brain, apparently, and that it, it causes it to rewire itself. And, you know, when you learn new things, your brain rewires itself. And I think that's what these emails are all about, coming in from people that never heard of the science before. They hear a podcast and their their mind goes crazy, saying there's a whole new field out there. I never even knew about this stuff. This is interesting stuff. Well, this guy, or these people, uh, three of them, uh, Hurley, uh, Dennett, and Adams Jr., uh, have collaborated on this book. It's not a big book, but it's, it's fun. It's a fun read. <laughs> and uh, it confirms some part of your own self, as that is, you're the only animal on the planet that laughs at themselves. So, <laughs> that we know of. That we know of. That's right. I mean, we don't think any other species is laughing at himself or themselves. And um, so Well, we know the amoebae take themselves way too seriously. They do. They do. That's <laughs> exactly right. And Alan is a living example of some organism that appreciates a good pun, a good joke. You even appreciate a bad joke, and so do I. Yes, particularly. Uh, yeah, and, you know, we find some humor in most of our lives, and I think humor allows us to re to lead a more enriched life. That's what I think. So I, I, I like humor a lot. And I think that's why Vince and I and Alan and um, Rich, we're, we're a good combination because we all have good senses of humor and we all, none of us take ourselves too seriously. And for that reason, we can give balance and focus to our subjects. So I think this book, that's a good pick for me. Inside jokes. Thank you, Dixon. You're welcome. Alan. Um, my pick is a blog that I just stumbled on recently. It's called Life Before the Dinosaurs. Ah. And um, oh my gosh, this is a <laughs> this is a blog <laughs> by um, initially when I when I saw it, somebody sent me the link and I looked at it and said, "Oh, this is a hoax." But I I poked around a little bit and I I think this is probably on the up and up. Um, it, it, the author of the blog is seven years old. Really? 
and is fascinated by the the life forms that existed before the dinosaurs, Good heavens. the Paleozoic era, um, and <laughs> he's, he's really into arthropods in particular. <laughs> um, and uh, if you if you look at the background information, um, he apparently reads up on this stuff all the time, wow. and he writes these uh, these postings about different animals. Um, the current one for uh, for today is on Camaroceras, um, which uh, he uses the analogy, it looked like a squid inside a thin ice cream cone. I'll be darned. Um, and it, he just profiles these, these animals that interest him. <laughs> um, so his mom actually types up the blog, but, she, but he dictates, he, he takes his notes as he's reading, and then My he goodness. dictates the story to her, and she um, she is the one who corrects spelling and all that, but wow. it's uh, it's the seven year old who's remarkable, fascinated by life before the dinosaurs. Oh, and we might great. want to send him a picture of the world's largest spider that was just recently discovered in China. He's he may already be aware of it in a fossil. Yeah, hmm. it's this a an aphilia, an like aphilia. It. It's a big web. Now builder. let's find a seven year old who writes about viruses. <laughs> <laughs> that might be a stretch. <laughs> Is there one out? No, I bet to you. Us? I bet you one surfaces. Rich Condit's grandkid will eventually do that. Maybe. That's great. I love it. Wow. Yeah. My pick is a blog. Also, it's called The Tree of Life. It is a blog written by Jonathan Eisen, who is a professor of microbiology at the University of California, Davis, and he's great an school. evolutionary biologist, and he writes casual stuff about what he's thinking pretty much uh, the um, and it's interesting to follow he recently published a paper in which he believes he has found a new branch in the tree of life he's basically going over the global ocean sequence set and a few others and um, he, he may have found he, it looks like he found ribosomal RNA and protein coding signatures that don't belong to uh, what we currently know exists. Mm. Mm. And he speculates that this may in fact be viral, but he can't really tell. So he has a few posts that um, talk about that. But over, all in all, he's very interesting. He's very media connected. He's on Twitter. He blogs a lot. Um, and I think we should have him on one of our yeah. podcasts at some point. Sounds I met good. him at uh, ASM GM in, in New Orleans. He's a very interesting guy. I want to get the seven-year-old on. <laughs> you want to get the seven-year-old on? <laughs> Better hurry, otherwise he's going to turn He'll eight. He'll be too old. That's right. <laughs> so that's the tree of life. We also have a listener pick of the week. This is from Lance, who is a postdoc over at the UK, although I think he's working somewhere else, and I've forgotten where that is. I would like to suggest a listener pick of the week or at least something interesting for you to read, as you have been discussing the failure to eradicate polio on previous TWIVs. It's a chapter in a book by Dominic Streetfield called A History of the World Since 9-11. One of the chapters toward the end describes the effect of 9-11 and the ensuing war on terror on efforts to eliminate polio. It might be a bit political for Twiv, and he may also stretch the conclusions a little, but anyway, it's an interesting read, and as a poliologist, I thought you might like it. So, um, is it too political? Nah, right? Well, we shouldn't be political, but you can certainly recommend this stuff. Sort through that right. stuff, probably. It's a listener pick. Was listening to stories of your father's tapeworm on the way to work today. Good stuff. <laughs> I'm catching up on past twips. Many thanks again for all the info through all the various media. How on earth do you find the time? I just buy it. <laughs> you can buy time these days. Did you can know you? that, Dixon? No, I, well... If it's a magazine. In the supermarket. At this in the place, magazine, but. yes. Yeah, you but. can buy spare time that other people don't need. <laughs> you can find Twiv at the iTunes store at the Zoom Marketplace. And you should subscribe if you don't already because you get each episode as we make them. You can also listen on your smartphone, either an Android or an iPhone. There's an app over at microbeworld.org slash app. Or you can go to twiv.tv where everything is contained and send us your questions to twiv at twiv.tv. Dixon de Pommier, thank you for joining us. It's a pleasure. Verticalfarm.com, medicalecology.com, and trichinella.org. Yep. Alan Dove, thank you. 
Always a pleasure. Alan is at alandove.com. Let's see what he's writing lately. <laughs> Uh-oh, did I put anything up lately? <laughs> <laughs> Something, Some YouTube video. I'll have mine well done, please. Ah, uh, yes. Hey, by the way, I forgot to mention, I have a blog now, too. I do. Do you? I do. It's on our Vertical Farm website, but I'm blogging now every week. I uh, challenge you to check it out. Where is it? At verticalfarm.com? Yep. Yes, well, that's what we mentioned, so we can go there and check it out. Do you write pithy stuff? I try. All right. Only when I'm writing about the inside of trees. <laughs> okay. Oh, <laughs> gee, thanks, Dick. <laughs> or helmets that you wear in the tropics. Yes. Sorry about that. All. That'll do it, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, by the way, in case oh, you didn't of know course. Me. Nice to meet you, Dixon. Oh, Alan. Vince. And no. you can find me at virology.ws. You're the glue of the group. I don't know. Sure you are. I'm just here. Yeah. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs>